Presuppositionalists often claim that atheists are unable to defeat their arguments due to a fundamental lack of understanding of their position. Well, buckle up, because we're going to settle this once and for all by going hard in the paint against the big bad daddy of presuppositional apologetics himself, Cornelius Van Til. <laughs> Hey everyone, JL here, and welcome back to Bridge the Divide, where I examine irrational beliefs, the irrational behaviors that follow, and how we, with education, rationality, and reason, can bridge the societal divides that they create. Now, before we begin our deep dive into Cornelius Van Til, we're going to have to answer two questions. One, who exactly was Cornelius Van Til? And two, what exactly is presuppositional apologetics? So, first question, who was Cornelius Van Til? Born in Grootgast, Netherlands to Eit Van Til in 1895, Cornelius would go on to become a Calvinist philosopher and theologian. He is most credited as the progenitor of modern presuppositional apologetics. For context, Calvinism is a major branch of Protestantism that focuses on doctrine set down by Reformation-era theologian John Calvin. Its emphases are on the sovereignty of God, the authority of the Bible, the total corruption of original sin, and predestination, that some are meant to be saved and others are not. After his family emigrated to Highland, Illinois in 1905, escaping the steep economic depression in the Netherlands, Cornelius grew up working with his father on a dairy farm. He was educated at Calvin Preparatory Academy, and around 1918, he entered Calvin College, both Calvinist evangelical programs within the educational arm of the Christian Reformed Church, or CRC. Founded in 1857 by Dutch immigrants, the CRC is a Protestant denomination that has its roots in the Dutch Reformed Church of the Netherlands and is theologically Calvinist. It was there at Calvin College that Van Til would develop an interest in the conservative Dutch Reformed theologians. From there, Van Til would go on to Calvin Theological Seminary, where he studied under Louis Burkhoff. Burkhoff was an American Reformed theologian whose primary work was in systematic theology. Systematic theology is a discipline of Christian theology that formulates an orderly, rational, and coherent account of the doctrines of Christian faith. Burkhoff's teachings would later start Van Til down the path of his own systematic theological work. After a year, and to avoid a growing religious controversy, Van Til would leave CTS and head over to Princeton Theological Seminary, where he would eventually graduate with a PhD in philosophy. Then, for undetermined reasons, Van Til would leave academia and take up the minister position of a small CRC congregation in Spring Lake, Michigan, where he stayed for about a year. It was then that Princeton would offer him a position teaching apologetics and after a year, a professorship of apologetics. But Van Til would turn the offer down because at the time, Princeton School of Theology was undergoing a major religious modernization with the organization shifting to a more liberal stance as opposed to its historically conservative one. It is this near pathological avoidance of opposing thought, modernization, and progressivism that I think will be the first clue into understanding the mind of Van Til. Van Til spent a brief time back with his congregation before he and three other Princeton faculty members then founded the conservative Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. And after 43 years teaching at Westminster, Van Til would enter semi-retirement in 1972, but occasionally returned to teach until 1979. He passed away in 1987 at the age of 91, preceded by his wife, Rena, and his son, Earl. In his lifetime, Van Til was published more times than I can count. He also composed over 20 books covering various areas of his expertise. His body of work would go on to influence a number of theologians, philosophers, and internet personalities, including Francis Schaeffer, John Frame, Greg Bonson, R.J. Rushdoony, and, you guessed it, our very own Darth Dawkins. Don't overtalk me! Van Til is also remembered for the Kuiper-Warfield Synthesis, 
The Kuiper Warfield synthesis was Van Til's attempt to establish a middle ground between the work of Netherlands Prime Minister, Dutch nationalist, and neo-Calvinist Abraham Kuiper, and the deferring views of Princeton theology professor B.B. Warfield. His concrete adherence to the transcendental argument, his incendiary relationship with fellow Calvinist theologian Karl Barth over Barth's use of Kantian epistemology, and the epic Clark Van Til controversy are a few more notable moments that we will take a look at. And on to our second question. Just what is presuppositional apologetics? Presuppositional apologetics is a school of Christian apologetics that claims that rational thought is only possible with the Christian worldview as its basis. It presupposes the supernatural revelation of the Bible and works predominantly to expose the flaws in other worldviews. Critics of this school of thought challenge it as being logically invalid because it begs the question of the truth of Christianity and the non-truth of all other worldviews. And they would be right. It is logically invalid. You are made of stupid. So, is that it? Van Til and his entire presuppositional apologetic are begging the question and therefore logically invalid. That should be it, right? Yeah. Stick around. Well, sure, we could stop there. But it's important to understand the mind of Van Til himself and the simple fact that he did more harm to the movement of Christianity than he may have actually realized. First and foremost, we need to understand the very nature of the man himself. Van Til grew up at the turn of the century, a time when economic hardships were at their worst. The Netherlands were in a state of economic crisis. Implementing the steam power-based industrial revolution of the 19th century was severely delayed, while the problems with the old Dutch economic system were repaired and replaced. It was a time of extreme hardship, with many families faced with either taking their chances with the uncertain future of the Dutch economy, or immigrating to what they hoped would be greener pastures. Now, it's no mystery that such hardships can definitely inform a person's perspective, and Van Til saw his fair share growing up. It could be posited that the difficulties he and his family faced in his formative years would later inform his relentless work ethic, his overwhelming desire to avoid direct controversy or progressive change, and his militaristic and belligerent adherence to his reformed theology. Throughout his life, Van Til would do everything he could to avoid direct controversy, either by simply leaving the situation or using his acerbic nature to ward it off. Prime examples of this were Van Til's quick departure from CTS for Princeton when attitudes were becoming too liberal for him. And that was followed by a sudden departure from Princeton when that institution underwent a progressive reform as well. But arguably the best example was when Van Til heard about a planned visit to Westminster by church historian John Gerstner. Van Til wrote to him saying, you may have heard that it is a great sin to differ with Van Til on his views of apologetics. You may also have heard that anyone who does and comes in striking distance of Philadelphia would have his head cut off. So I would advise you not to come near my office. Putting aside the fact that he referred to himself in the third person, friends of Van Til's would say that he was only joking, that his rhetoric was not a mirror of the man himself, that in person he was actually quite gracious and humble. Was such behavior just the hyperbolic rhetoric of a philosophical gadfly? Or was it the passive-aggressive behavior of a cowardly conservative who was terrified of the future and the change that it brought? While we contemplate those possibilities, let's jump to the two largest issues with Van Til, one often discussed and the other sometimes overlooked. It was Van Til's unrelenting assertions about the creator-creation distinction between God and man that led to his direct confrontation with Gordon Clark. Put simply, it was because Clark espoused an interpretation of the nature of God that threatened everything Van Til had spent his career building. Van Til saw Clark's position as dangerous because it proposed a neutral approach to the incomprehensibility of God, focusing on what humans can actually know, and primarily relying on their autonomous reasoning to determine the truth. From this neutral position, Van Til believed that Clark was ultimately justifying human reliance on their own autonomy. Van Til asserted that the creator-creation distinction established the irrefutable sovereignty and hierarchy of God as the grounds for all reason. 
He justified this with the controversial doctrine of total depravity. The doctrine of total depravity asserts that human beings' ability to reason has been corrupted by original sin, therefore rendering it unreliable. Van Til would argue that because of that inherent corruption, humans must reject their autonomous reasoning and rely solely upon the authority of the Bible and the sovereignty of God to know the truth of anything. From there, the sovereignty of God becomes an epistemological principle as much as it is a religious and metaphysical one. In the article, A Critique of Cornelius Van Til, D.R. Trethewey describes Van Til's system as nothing more than a priori dogmatic transcendental irrationalism, which he has attempted to give a Christian name to. It's also been suggested that Van Til's assertion of the creator-creation distinction is justified by nothing more than the basic etymological leaps from creature to creation to creator. The debate that took place between Van Til and Clark was regarded as deeply intense. Round one, fight! And when the dust settled, many critics cited it as not evidence for the incomprehensibility of God, but for the incomprehensibility of Van Til himself. Van Til's complaint ultimately failed, and Clark was ordained. It was a result that is often seen as the lowest point of Van Til's career and a dark time for the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Herman Hoeksema, founder of the Protestant Reformed Churches, addressed Van Til's position. He argued in their periodical The Standard Bearer that the irrationalism of the Westminster faculty disguised their Arminian doctrines, which they insisted were truly reformed. Conspiratorial thinking aside, we do have to ask, what would compel a man to attack his own? It could be argued that Van Til's position was informed by years of intense conservative evangelical training, that the minister's education and training reinforced an observation that more and more people were, to his interpretation, slipping from the faith, something he saw Clark's argument leading to, that Van Til's entire position was methodically and myopically through years of meticulous effort designed specifically and solely to keep people in the faith. And he would accomplish this by demanding and justifying a total suspension of his congregation's reason in favor of what he asserted was God's reason. But really, his loss came about because of the second, somewhat overlooked issue with Van Til. And that was his utterly ridiculous use and sanctimonious butchering of language itself. Mark Garcia, a proponent of Van Tilian thought, spoke at length of Van Til's often impenetrable and painful prose, often giving theological and philosophical terms his own unique definitions. Garcia also addressed Van Til's sometimes maddening revisionist use of vocabulary. This issue with Van Til's work has led to innumerable problems with even understanding what Van Til was trying to say, that a combination of his ostentatious, possibly pretentious style and atypical vernacular has only further confounded what are already deeply complex and highly subjective fields of philosophical thought. And since Van Til isn't around anymore, to get a real sense of the legacy he left, we only need look at the behavior of his proponents. The authoritarian style in which they preach Van Til's position. The demand for total suspension of human reason to justify that position. The assertion that without the Christian God, you can't know anything at all. Considering all of this, I think the conclusion becomes incredibly clear. Science has always taken the position that because humans are not omniscient, we can't know anything for absolute certainty. This intellectually honest position is what drives the search for more evidence, demands reliance on predictive modeling, and also makes science provisional. It is this provisional nature that Van Til philosophically exploited. He did so by preying on the natural human fear of the unknown, and by offering God as the ultimate solution for things that scientists, for all of their intellectual honesty, could not. And when we take into account Van Til's own words in regards to the deep regrets that he felt over losing his prized pupil, E.J. Carnell, upon the release of one of Carnell's books, Van Til was quoted as saying, 
I fear I shall again have to appear ungracious in dealing with it. Perhaps I was brought into the world to be a nuisance to others. I want to win Carnell back to the reformed truth in apologetics if I can. It could be argued that Van Til simply regretted losing what he considered to be a bright pupil and friend. It could also be argued that Van Til's authoritarian approach elicited a profound inability to accept that someone that he had mentored had found a path of understanding contradictory to his own. Was it the painful regret of an aging man taking stock of his shortcomings? Or the buried ego of a self-righteously bellicose evangelical raising its head? Regardless of the conclusion, I think we have a better understanding now of Cornelius Van Til, the man behind the rhetoric. He wasn't a god. He wasn't a prophet. He was just a human being. He was a minister, one who so dedicated his life to the church that he loved that he often found himself in stark contention with anyone who thought differently from him. He was a philosopher, a person who studied deeply of human thought and experience, yet ultimately only asked questions and made no actual advances in explaining anything at all. He ferociously defended his faith, his reliance on his belief without evidence, and his deeply emotional need for the Bible to be the absolute truth. His eisegesis divided the church. His entire argumentation is logically invalid, leading to further atrocious argumentation in an attempt to defend it. His disciples are often seen as unforgiving, uncharitable, rabidly myopic zealots. There are some that have even referred to Van Tillism as almost cult-like, that defenders and idolaters of Van Til's belligerent authoritarian style and obfuscating verbiage often engage in the sarcophagy of their fellow Christians should they dare oppose or contradict their viewpoints. And it is such reprehensible behavior that ultimately harms the purported message of Christianity because it exposes the fallacious argumentation of Van Tillian thought and its intolerance of progressive ideals, ultimately driving the people who encounter such behavior straight into the reliable arms of education, rationality, and reason. So, keep up the good work, boys. And that will conclude our look at Cornelius Van Til, father of begging the, I mean, presuppositional apologetics. Thank you so much for joining me. If you liked the video, please like and subscribe, and be sure to hit that bell for notifications. Don't forget, this month is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and in support, my beard will be pink for the whole of October. Donate links are in the description. And if you like scary movies, be sure to check me and my filmmaker friends out at the Week in Horror podcast, now in our third season. All the links you need to support this channel and our podcast are below. Thank you again. I'm JL, and as usual, be safe, be excellent to each other, and together, we can bridge the divide.